don't know. It's Creeks, man. I don't have board docs open, but I I vote to whatever we're trying to do. Go into the meeting. <laughs> I second. I have board docs open. <laughs> vote either way. Um, okay. Yeah. Can, I get our, can, I get call, can I get a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Brian DeSantis. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, so I have um, Brian, Diana, Jordana, Alex, Yorgos, all yes to open the meeting. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay. Can I um, get a motion to convene an executive session to um, discuss um, the employment of a particular person and a potential litigation matter? So moved. Second. All in favor? Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi. Uh, so we will log. So we will log off board docs, uh, board members will, and then we will join the executive session link, and then we will join back uh, at seven for the budget hearing. Okay. Thank you. Bye, all. Hey everybody, so sorry that we are late. And we're back. All right, do we have everybody? Let's see. Yeah. Susan, looks like we're still waiting for our board members to rejoin after exec. <sighs> looks like we're still waiting on Yorgos and Chris. Sorry, everybody, for the delay. We ended up having some trouble, technical difficulties getting into exec. And then once we were in, it took a little bit longer. Um, while we're waiting, um, Victoria, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, so we, we convened out of exec. Um, the motion was made by Brian, seconded by Diana, um, approved by everybody. And it was at 7.34. Okay, thank you. Um, you know what, though? I think since we're all pretty familiar with this budget stuff, we do have four board members. So why don't we go ahead with the budget hearing? And hopefully everybody else will join shortly. Um, it looks like Chris is saying, can you hear me? Um, so I think we can go ahead. Um, Jeff or Lori, I don't know if which one of you is starting with the budget hearing. So do we do we go with the, the Pledge of Allegiance or we go right into the budget hearing? Uh, it looks like the way that board docs is set up, it's we go into the budget hearing, but I'm fine with doing whatever you guys want. Uh, we can do the budget hearing. So, um, uh, Lori, are you there? Lori, did you unmute? I see she's on the call. Lori, did you unmute? I'll try now. Is Yep, can you hear can me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going to share the screen. And can we see? Yes. The, we can. Uh, okay. Okay. So welcome to the budget hearing for uh, today. 
Uh, we will be looking at our proposed budget for the 2020-2021 year. And we'll go to our first slide, this, which is just presents an overall look. Our proposed budget is $44,332,423. Uh, this is a 3.37% increase from last year. Our property tax limit, how much we could um, tax up to but not over the cap, is 3.07%. The board has approved a tax levy of 2.71, which is under our allowable property tax levy limit. Our projected limit is $39 million. Our projected tax levy is $39,737,613. Our actual limit is $39,876,512. And we are under the tax levy limit by $138,899. And this will be the ninth consecutive year we are presenting a tax levy under the limit. All right. So we've done that every single year since the tax levy limit has been uh, in place. Lori, this is Scott. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you go up and click on from current slide so that it fills the whole screen? It's easier for everybody to see, please. Sure. Um, the second one over. The second one over. No, no, no. Go back to file. I'm sorry. Is that right now? Do you see like a huge slide? Or no? No, cl click on file. Click on file. Ah, forget it. Just use the back arrow. I just keep going, arrow. I'm sorry. Just just go from there. Okay. Um, this last, uh, the next slide is uh, from the uh, State Controller's Office. This goes and shows our trend for the last five years. It shows basically we're under the cap for the last five years. Our proposed, uh, if you go all the way to the bottom, you can see that every single year we've been under the tax levy limit by the amount. Also, the difference of what our actual tax levy limit was, last year was 4%, the year before that it was 3.9, 3.2, 2.5, and 1.5. Um, it just gives you a general idea of where we're going and where the tax levy growth is. You can see that we've had um, a tax levy growth as far as the actual um, assessed values every single year, about 2%. Um, this year, it, it's only 1.55%, uh, uh, but for the last three years prior, it's been over 2%. Go to the next slide where we're looking at the proposed budget expenditures. This shows you a comparison between this year and our current year, and also the changes, all right, dollar value, and also the percent of the change. Now, the percent of the change is only against the actual expense for the prior year, so um, it's not like um, in smaller expenditures, all right, the percentage can be greater for what actually is really sometimes a very small dollar amount. So, for example, on BOCES service charges, um, we're now at 144. The prior year was 139. Uh, total increase is only 5,000, but the change in that particular line was a 3.5% increase. Overall, the budget has increased 3.37%, which comes out to $1,447,048. Go to my next slide. This shows you our revenue and what we're projecting for the current year. And I am showing a reduction in our state aid of approximately 20% in foundation aid. And I've also lowered our projections in BOCES and in um, transportation aid. 
mainly because those are expense-driven aids. And if we don't spend that money this year, we're not going to receive aid on it. So reduction in expense in the current year reflects on a reduced expense, uh, reduced revenue in the following year. Our total projection for uh, reduction in state aid for this year is um, a little over a half a million dollars, 519000 um, that is also combined with reduction in other revenues, mainly in non-resident tuition. So our total uh, other revenues on the budget are reduced by $724,000 this year. Um, our tax levy, we're keeping to 2.7% increase, which would be an increase of $1,049,639. And we are um, projecting that we would use the difference from fund balance, mainly from savings of this year, of $1,591,783. We would not be touching any reserves. Go to our next slide. This is the projected tax impact. Um, we have two lines for the 220, 2021 years. The first one is based on our current assessed values. The second one is projected with 1.155% tax base growth. So if we had no tax base growth at all, our I would expect a home with the tax assessed value of 6400 all right, to go up $132 for the year. With the tax base growth, I expect it to only see a $52 increase for the year on the uh, town of East Hampton. For the town of South Hampton, for a home that is assessed at uh, $1 million, we're expecting if there was no tax growth for an increase of $120 for the annual year, if it was including the 1.55 tax base growth, that would be a $50.82 growth for the entire year. So that's what they could expect as an increase. And you could see the actual monthly impact of that is the last column on the slide, 11.01. 4.36, $10.05, and 4.23. Um, this is just uh, our, the, our budget statement. Our budget statement is located on our website. Um, because of COVID, we normally would have this also in the main offices of both schools and also at the library. But since they are closed, we only have it on our website under the 2020-2021 uh, budget. And if you look on the bottom, I've put exactly how you go in to go and find it. You click on menu, you look for the 2020-2021 budget information, and then you hit the proposed 2020-2021 budget statement. And in that statement, you will find the budget in a three part component. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like in the next slide. Our property tax report card, our school academic report cards for each school, our district fiscal accountability summary from the New York State Comptroller's Office, and our administrative com compensation disclosure notice, as well as the exemption report for both the town of South Haven and the town of um, East Hampton. Here is the 2020-2021 three-part budget component. This is consolidated. It's not giving you a breakdown per expense, but on the um, budget statement, each one of these expenses will be laid out. Our combined total for administrative component is four million and fifty nine thousand four hundred and forty five representing nine point one six percent of the budget. Our program component, which is all our educational expenses, is thirty five million two hundred and 
$379,278, or almost 80% of our budget, and our capital, which com um, is co uh, combines our operation and maintenance of school buildings and grounds, our transfer to capital fund, and our debt service is 11.04%. And that all adds up to our current budget, projected budget of $44,332,400, uh, $332,400,000. We'll go to our next slide. Um, of course, if our proposed budget passes, the district will enact that budget effective July 1st. If the proposed budget fails, um, the, the budget revote date is June 16th. So um, that's virtually impossible for us to run another budget vote because unless the uh, governor changes the time, uh, I can't see us doing another absentee ballot in that amount of time. So the board would have to adopt the contingency budget immediately which would be enacted on July 1st, which would mean reductions of about $971,615. And the main uh, things to consider would be uh, we would eliminate all expenditures for equipment for capital projects and limit our administrative courses. Course, I would... Um, I, most of the overtime is eliminated. There's virtually no overtime expenditures budgeted. And all of our facility usage by the public would also be limited in accordance with law. We would not be allowed to um, allow use of the facilities unless the, um, the vendor or the uh, organization was paying for the total expenses which would relate to that, including overtime, uh, cleaning expenses, et cetera, et cetera, so that there would be no cost at all for the district to allow the facility usage. Let's go to my next slide. Um, the contingency budget um, is estimated to be go down by $971,615. Um, but we would still need to increase our budget, our appropriated fund balance to $1,669,807. Um, that's about 74000 more than what we're planning on uh, increasing our uh, using if with the budget pass. And that's totally due to the fact that we cannot increase our property tax levy, we have to have a 0% increase, the same as uh, the budget, the tax levy was for last year. So our difference would be the $724, $724,374 from uh, difference in the levy and reserves from last year, and then the 470 and plus that Four hundred and seventy-five thousand four hundred thirty-three dollar increase in the budget, which comes out to the one million six hundred and sixty-nine thousand eight hundred and seven dollars. And I should have gone to the next slide so you could see those dollars. You could see here I did a contingency budget uh, revenue, and also um, the proposed budget revenue, and from last year, and if you look, again, we're down $519,271 in, uh, in state aid, and then total revenues before the tax levy and reserve were lower by $724.374, and our general tax levy is exactly the same as the prior year, and you can see that we would need $1,669,807 to uh, get up to the contingent budget of $43,360,000. 
$1,808. So the total budget increase would be 101.11% if we went to the contingency budget. Um, when we're doing the contingency budget, we also have to go and take into consideration the administrative cap. We are not allowed to exceed the cap that um, was, the min, uh, was in place for last year, or if it's lower, all right, what's in place for um, the current uh, proposed budget. So we, I do a computation on this page, and you can see the administrative component is divided by the administrative component plus the program component. We don't consider capital component at all. Um, in our proposed budget, that percentage comes to 10.297%. Under the contingency, it's 10.293%. So that is the lower um, amount that I have to at least meet. So for the contingency budget has to be at least that um, low. So here I've shown you the different components and the percentages where the budget is 3.37% and the contingency budget is 1.11%. And our contingency administration budget is under the cap. It's at 10.049%. So uh, we meet the uh, administrative cap. Uh, one of the other things that is on the absentee ballot is our expenditure from the existing fleet capital reserve. We're asking the public to approve uh, use of the uh, fleet capital reserve to replace a school bus that is uh, approximately 10 years old. It's now at the end of its useful life. Um, because we are using the money from the ca uh, fleet capital reserve, a yes vote does not increase the district's budget and it will not increase the tax levy. And the proposition itself follows on this next page. And this is the exact wording of it. Um, for this bus, it's basically uh, one of the minibuses, and it reads as you know the following: It's a 2021 GMC Chevy chassis Thomas Minotaur body model school bus, and that will cost us about fifty-six thousand dollars. Right. And the last thing we have to say: This year is new and different. We do have an absentee ballot only. Um, all ballots must be received by the district clerk no later than 5 p.m. on Tuesday, June 9th, and after which we would have our annual meeting. I'd like to guys go with the last several years of our budget vote results. Oops. And you can see that um, since 2012 to 2000 to last year, we have um, gone way over our 50% uh, that's necessary to pass a budget under the cap. And our average in the last uh, nine years has basically been a 71% tax rate, tax pass rate, and a 2.83% has been our average um, tax levy increase. And my last slide is I would like to thank the public for supporting our budget um, and my sincere appreciation to all our administrators and staff and board members who work so hard on developing this budget. And we really try to cut it down to the bare you know, necessities to go and keep our programs uh, going. Does anybody have any questions? Laura, hey, this is Chris Tice. Thank you Hi. so much for the presentation. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, 
In terms of the budget, if it gets voted down, and we're all, I think we're all hopeful that that doesn't happen, but um, if the state has determined that we would have to have a second vote by the 16th, what I'm hearing is that you think from a practical standpoint that's impossible. Um, mm -hmm. Has there been any discussion with state ed or has our attorney had any discussion with anybody about if, you know, if that is not feasible to physically be able to pull that off, is there any latitude being provided or we're we just kind of uh, accepting it as we're not even going down that path? I did speak with our attorney and he said at this point that there's no, you know, the, it's written in the law, that's our date, and they've not made any, um, you know, attempt to go and put in another date. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible that he might not, you know, he could go and do an executive order and allow us to have the additional time. But if we have to do another absentee ballot within a week to get it out to people and back in, I just don't think that is a very feasible um, event. Chris, I also had a discussion with uh, our uh, council about this issue, and um, he, Lori, accurately summarized uh, <clears throat> the discussion that I had with Tom as well, which is that he's, along with a number of uh, other attorneys, have contacted the governor's office and explained uh, the impracticality of um, having another vote within seven days, given the absentee ballot format. Um, so obviously anything at this point is pure speculation, but I would uh, <clears throat> guess that if there are a number of districts that uh, fail uh, this year, that there'll be tremendous pressure to come up with some type of accommodation. Again, speculative on my part, <clears throat> but given that um, the timeline is entirely unreasonable and the, the, the original intention was to have two votes before going to contingency. I would imagine depending upon the number of uh, failed budget votes, uh, we may see some action. Thank you. Um, and then my second question, which is just about the process, because this is the first time we're having to do an absentee ballot for everybody, is when we appointed the personnel to work on the election, mm -hmm. we approved staff, current staff members without any additional stipend because we said it was going to be done during work hours. So does that mean that the ballots are due by the 9th at 5 and then the following day they get counted? Is that how it works? Not right um, now. The, the <clears throat> guidance that we've received from um, our council is that the counting should be should begin at 5 p.m. Um, on on the 9th. That we're looking for further clarification from that. Uh, there is a conference call scheduled for the 4th of June, uh, at which time that is going to be discussed in in more detail. Um, but at this point, our tentative plan is to. Um, work beginning on uh, the 9th at 5 p.m. and that event has to be live streamed. Um, our attorney put out a, a counseling memorandum with uh, a question and answer format anticipating a lot of um, issues that are going to come up and, and trying to be proactive. So uh, that's been distributed to you know, the district clerk has looked at it and that will be distributed to all uh, of the the voting workers uh, prior to the ninth. So as of now, from our understanding, does that mean that they have to continue to work till it's done or is there a break at night and they come back? I don't have the answer to that yet. Um, okay. I've asked the same question, hoping to get clarification before, uh, sooner rather than later. But right now, the way it's supposed to happen is that when the ballots come in, um, <clears throat> we can we can check off that uh, we've received them prior to the ninth, but we can't open um, the, the envelope that comes within it until the ninth. And when we actually open um, the ballot envelope, what you're supposed to do is the very specific directions, it's supposed to be folded and you're supposed to take that folded absentee ballot and put it in a bin um, to be looked at at a later time so that you, that 
there are privacy concerns, that private, privacy concerns are not violated. In other words, when you first take the ballot out, you're not supposed to unfold the ballot uh, at that time because you could then correlate the vote to the name on the envelope. So then time has to pass and then it starts to get counted. Correct. So and it sounds like it's ill-defined on how much time. Right. I, not that long. I think the expectation is that it's put into, put, put into a bin, a counting bin, if you will, and then um, other people uh, will, will count. And there's, there's very specific uh, guidance with regard to social distancing and, and how the room has to be set up and, and all of those things. There's specific uh, guidance as to uh, transporting the, the received ballots from uh, where we receive them to the to the balloting place and minimum number of people that should be involved, all these types of things. So it sounds like sometime, hopefully on the tenth, there'll be information. There'll be an answer. Sometime prior to the to the ninth, and we've got a lot of information vis-a-vis -vis our council in that question and answer document that I that I uh, just referenced. But we're hoping to get even more information in the next few days. No, I'm sorry. What I meant was that w the district will make the public announcement about the results of the budget vote and election probably on the 10th at some time. That would be my guess. Thank you. Jeff, just one question on that. If, if someone lives in the district and did not get a ballot, what do we, have we discussed what the procedure is? Uh, they should uh, contact our district clerk. So all the, the uh, communication that's gone out um, both on the postcard and, and also some email blasts that have, sent, have been sent out state that if you uh, have not received a ballot and believe you should have, please contact the district clerk uh, and make uh, that person aware of it. Great. And, and I think ballots are still arriving because I know I got mine Saturday. Some other people in my household got it today. I know people who have gotten some in the household and not others. So I think it's still being delivered the next day or two. Yeah, and yeah. I, I do want to compliment um, our district clerk, Victoria Handy, because she took the initiative to go down uh, and communicate directly with the postmaster um, and, you know, stress the importance of the delivery being expedited. Um, so the turnaround has been very quick. Normally mail goes to Farmingdale, uh, I believe, and then comes back to Sag Harbor. I think in this instance that that transfer was not made due in large part to the efforts of the district clerk. Awesome, thank you, Victoria. Um, all right, so if there's no other questions, we can move on. I'm taking the silence as an opportunity to move on. So thank you, Lori, for the um for the presentation and um we look forward to getting everybody's ballots back uh, so we can you know hopefully pass pass this budget and uh and get some new board members um all right so moving on um if all the board members could just make sure you are um logged into board docs <clears throat> We can then, uh, budget hearing was 3.1, so we can go to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, States of, America, of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. So turning it over to superintendent's report. Jeff, you have an update on the Learning Center. I do. So um, I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. Um, Mr. Wilkin. I'm sorry, do you have any public input, Jordan? Did you want to do public input? I apologize. Um, I did not receive any public input statements, but you are correct. I should have, I should have paused and I'm sorry. let everyone know that. I think we can go on to um, the superintendent's report. So uh, Mr. Wilkin and I have met um, on several different occasions with uh, employees at H2M, structural engineers, architects. Um, we did meet with them on the 27th of May. 
the primary purpose of that uh, meeting was to um, ascertain the width of the rear drive after the um, gravity wall system uh, is installed. And what we found was that at the narrowest point, <clears throat> the um, width was 12 feet, which is sufficient for the intended use of that uh, rear drive, which was basically a, a vehicle drop off, not a bus drop off, but a vehicle drop off for uh, students, for parents dropping their children off. It was never intended to be a bus drop off. And I confirmed that with Mr. Malone. So that was generally good news. Um, on this slide, you see a picture of the three options. Um, as it relates to the timeline, the option that is, is most uh, desirable to us is the option uh, on the left, which is the first uh, stone. That's limestone and that's in stock. Um, so that is what I had indicated to H2M that we would go with. I did speak to uh, a project manager this afternoon there and their tentative timeline is to have the, the plans finalized by this Friday, uh, June 5th. Uh, at which point they'll be sent out to New York State vendors. Uh, the goal being to have bids back, uh, and this is where their familiarity with the bidders on Long Island will come in um, by Friday, June 12th. So again, the hope is by June 12th uh, to have bids in from New York State approved vendors, um, meaning that we would not have to go through the bid process and we could just, we could just contract with them directly. Uh, I asked a question about uh, the, the likelihood that work would start quickly. Um, the project manager told me today that, uh, that in New York, a lot of work that was uh, previously slated to begin in the summer has actually started earlier than normal due to the fact that school has not been in session. So uh, H2M's take is that the likelihood is that work because it essentially started earlier on many other projects would start earlier in the summer and there would be more uh, contractors available uh, to complete work. So all of that is good news. The takeaway is the plans are ready by June 5th. We'll have our numbers in terms of bids uh, through New York State vendors, hopefully by June 12th. So the second uh, topic that uh, I have to discuss tonight, uh, I'll. I'll turn it over to Victoria Handy, who's taking a leadership role in the um, election process. As all of you know, the executive order not only moved the, the um, election date to June 9th, but also mandated that, um, the, that, all, uh, that the whole voting process be through absentee ballot. So I'll turn it over to Victoria to talk a little bit about the mechanics of how um, that worked in Sag Harbor. And I talked a little bit of already about what uh, June 9th will bring, but uh, feel free to add anything, Victoria. I think you did a great job, Jeff. Um, I just want to emphasize that all of the ballots, um, 5,800 uh, and change, went out together on Friday morning. As soon as the post office opened, we were there. Um, so I understand they are coming to some houses in drips and drabs. So just hang in there, and if you don't receive it by the end of the day tomorrow, um, please give me a call or email me. I do have the um, voter registration list from the Suffolk County Board of Elections, and I have been getting calls, and we've been checking and um, verifying that ballots were, in fact, mailed out to these people. So um, if it doesn't come by tomorrow, um, you can reach out to me. Um, but... So yeah, we're still waiting on the uh, to find out if we'll start the count on the ninth. And um, the I mean, you described the ballots. The way we do the absentee ballots is the way we've always done the absentee ballots. It's just going from what we usually do about fifty to sixty a year. We're doing almost six thousand, but it's the same process. So the envelope will come back to us in the prepaid envelope, and um, we will check them off we can do that ahead of time, check them off against the voter registration list to make sure that they are coming back from registered voters. And once that is done, we can separate the oath envelope, which is the 
sealed envelope that is signed by the voter that contains the ballot. Those we do not open until after five o'clock. Um, once five o'clock comes and we start opening those, they do, you open the envelope, you drop the folded ballot into a box. And um, once they're all dropped into boxes, they get shuffled about so that there is no way to determine what, what ballot came from what envelope. And once they're all um, out of the oath envelopes, then they can start unfolding them after they've been mixed up. And then once they're all unfolded, then they can start the count. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention is, uh, again, to emphasize that it is not, has nothing to do with the return uh, of, the, of when it's postmarked. It has to be, to me, um, by June 9th, 5 o'clock. Um, and we'll see, depending on how many ballots we get back, um, we'll see how long it takes to count, and then we'll make the announcement. Uh, we're supposed to announce within 24 hours, so to be determined. Um, two questions that I just have, just because I, I feel like they'll come up, and uh, you know, as board members, we'll just get, we'll have to field these questions. So, um, one is say someone does not receive their ballot and think they thinks they should have, let's say by Wednesday and they contact you, what happens? How do we get them the ballot? Um, it is supposed to be an all male election, um, but I have talked uh, to the attorneys on this and if the ballot's destroyed or if they don't receive it and they are registered voters, we're gonna try the best we can to um, expedite them you know, a, a, a ballot. Um, however, if two ballots come back uh, from the same registered voter, they will both be discounted. Okay. Um, of course, it's illegal to tamper with an election, but if two come back for whatever reason, both will be discounted. Got it. And we can still track that. So if a second one goes out, it'll have like the same number or something so that if... Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. And then um, the other thing is if people let's say they send back their ballots today. If they give you a call saying, did you receive my ballot? Is that something you're able to give them information on or no? Well, there are 6,000 going out. I don't know how many are coming I, back in. We're I just have wanted to be able to say people. We technically, we could probably find out. Yes. If, if we received it, it's, you know, we'll be busy, but we'll try. Sure. Yeah, I, the numbers don't make sense, but I just wasn't sure if, if it was even like a, a thing where you, because like you said of the privacy concerns and, and not knowing what's associated with what, I just wasn't sure if, you know, if that's, if that's a technical possibility, let, you know, well, numbers aside, when, volumes. When, aside. They do, when they do come back to me, I do check them off in the voter registration that I have received them, so. Okay, okay, um, okay great. So then you could, so then potentially, if someone wanted to know that information, they could foil it and find it out after the fact, whether or not their ballot was received. Yep. Okay. There's no just reason why they need to know by the election. It's just a question of kind of, I wanted to understand like how that information works. A reg regular vote, there's a polling list of who's, who's voted. Yep, that makes sense. I just wasn't sure if it changed at all how, how this worked here. So great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think that does the superintendent's report, unless there are other questions. I, I just had a quick question, and it referenced my question from earlier, which is when we approved the personnel, we publicly stated that, that we didn't have to assign any additional funds for the effort like we do every other year, where we, we, uh, we publicly uh, vote on a certain amount we're paying them. And we didn't this year because we thought it would be done during the day, but I assume we're going to be paying, we'll have, the district will have to pay overtime, correct, to get this done? Um, I don't, I don't want to categorically answer that yet. Um, let, okay. me, let me talk to the employees and, and see what, see what the answer is. I don't have the answer to that yet. All right. I just didn't know if we were obligated to be transparent about that since every other year we've, you know, we've, um, stated it overtly and voted on it. Mm -hmm. No, I get it. I, I think, uh, the question is whether or not, because the hours are different from five until whenever, uh, that obligates us to compensate in a different manner because I and I'll I'll check that and get back to you. All righty. Thank you. I think there was one more update um, with regard to uh, 
the Sag Harbor Learning Center. Uh, Paul has been, Paul Wilkin, the Director of Facilities, uh, has been working um, with the various contractors to go through the punch list. We did have a delay with one contractor. Uh, I had a conversation with that um, uh, contractor and they've since uh, been very cooperative. So uh, Paul, do you wanna go through this real quickly? Hello everyone. Uh, you, you can hear me, right? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so there is, a, there is a lot going on at the Learning Center right now. Um, there was a, a bit of um, time where uh, no one was showing up, but in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, everybody seems to be back on site now, and uh, we're moving along nicely. Uh, they're, all, they're working on their uh, final punch list, and uh, they're looking to close out any remaining items that are still uh, left to be done. The uh, plumbing contractor has pretty much completed their whole punch list. Um, I have to still, still walk around and check everything, um, but they're, they're pretty much done. Uh, HVAC systems are 99% completed. Uh, the only thing that I know that still has to be done is that we have to tie it into um, our existing system that we have at the high school and the elementary school. Um, the other thing is the fire alarm systems are approximately 95% completed. Um, most of the devices are installed. I think there's some um, programming that needs to be done, and then we still have to tie in the elevator. Um, there's a couple things being worked out with that. Um, the electrical contractor uh, is now finally on site. We did have a bit of an issue with them, um, but they're, they're on site as of uh, about three or four days ago, and um, they're working through their punch list. So um, I've been checking on them every day to make sure that they uh, are showing up. Um, the general contractor um, will be following up with painting uh, touch-ups and remaining uh, ceiling tiles uh, that have to be installed. After all, the contractors are finally done pulling their wires or working above the ceilings. Then, we'll, then they will go around and close in all the rest of the tiles that are not there. Uh, we don't want to do that too fast because then they wreck the tiles if they have to go back in there. So um, we're, we're going to wait to the absolute last minute to finally put all the tiles in. Uh, the fire inspection and in the elevator system programming um, still has to occur. Well, hopefully that's going to be done soon. We have to get all the, all the systems up and running, and then we can call a fire inspector in to give us a final inspection. Um, and then the last thing to get done will be the final cleaning and the building turnover. Um, we hope to have this done in the next few weeks. Um, if everything works out like it's going so far, uh, uh, we could be two, three weeks, hopefully, and we'll be done. That's about it. Any questions? Thanks so much, Paul. It's really encouraging to see that that final contractor started uh, showing up and getting to work. Uh, just a quick yep. question. I'm sorry if I missed it, Paul. So based on, on um, everybody kind of being back on site, um, when do you think the punch list will be done? And, you know, with the, considering the wall is a separate issue, the rest of it will be completed. I would, I'm really pushing for two to three weeks to be completed. Sure turnover, cleaned everything. That's exciting news. And then it sounds like one of the things we haven't done yet is just talk about and agree on signage, correct? Yes, the signage for the front of the building is something we still need to bring up. Oh. Okay, thanks. No. All right, uh, moving on, consent agenda, it looks like we only have um, two things and they're in action items, so no consent agenda. Um, action item 8.1, can I get a motion to approve 8.1, increase budget for insurance proceeds? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yes, can we please get an explanation of what this is for? Lori, do you wanna answer that? <clears throat> Lori. Like, yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, that would be for uh, the insurance for um, the web uh, services. Cyber. No, for uh, when we had the uh, cyber incident. All right. That is what the uh, 40,000 is for. 
Didn't we, thank you, didn't we approve something similar to this at our last meeting or the meeting before? Uh, we did, not for the same amount, for a, a smaller amount. So is it this, I'm confused what, what the difference is between that and this. Um, I got two separate checks, so I received one earlier and I put that on for the agenda when I received it. And this would be the second one that we received. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other discussion? Just waiting for your gross and Brian. I hit it, should be coming through. You're good, and Yorgos? That's unanimous, thank you. I'm gonna get a motion to accept the letter of, resigna letter of retirement of William Hagerman. So moved with our thanks. Second. Second. Thanks, uh, I'd like to thank him for his service. Any discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to do the same and recognize that he's been working in our district for 26 years, which is a long time and we appreciate decades of service to our kids and community. Can I add something? Um, yes. So I've worked with Randy for 23 years. William is known as Randy to, to all of us who know him well. Uh, I had two of his kids go through the um, Pearson Middle School and High School. And um, I just want to personally thank him for uh, his service. Um, he uh, has been a source of uh, wisdom having been here for so many years. He's a very uh, thoughtful, intelligent guy, and um, he's going to be missed. So I wish him well in retirement. Um, just wanted to say that. Yeah, he's going to be a, a hard person to uh, replace um, from my point of view, because he really knows the building inside and out. So it's a big, big loss for us. Okay, that is unanimous. All right. Um, all right, it looks like under the other topics, it looks like they're just um, placeholders. Um, I don't believe there's any items for discussion, unfinished business or potential items not scheduled. So moving on to public input two. Um, again, I did not receive any public input um, today. So with that, um, we uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, Tridana, there was one item that we didn't cover in the exec session. Can I just request that we cover it at the next session we have then? Sure thing, yeah. Thank you. Okay, just waiting for Yorgos and Chris. I've sent it, so it's on its way. Victoria, I'm um, yes. Hey. Okay, that's unanimous, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Have, Have a good, good night. night. Good night. Good night. Good night.